Well, it's time once again for all of us to plan our upcoming racing season and to put our names into all of those lotteries if we haven't already. Both Audrey and I just put our names in for UTMB 2022, so we'll see in a week or so if we're heading to Chamonix in September. Races are selling out faster and faster each year, with more of them moving to a lottery system. But fortunately, as the sport continues to grow, new races keep popping up as well. In fact, I sometimes find myself getting a little bit of choice paralysis as I look for new and interesting challenges. It seems like every trail running race these days markets themselves as the toughest race around. I've seen so many claim to be the hardest in the world, it kind of leaves you wondering how can they all claim to be the hardest? And what really makes a race hard? So I thought I'd record what is more of a video essay with some of my thoughts on the answers to these questions ultimately to help you to better choose races for your upcoming season. I'll explore all of the different variables that come into play to make some races harder for some runners, but easier for others. Because spoiler alert, the difficulty of a race is kind of relative to the individual. And that's ultimately the thesis that I'll be arguing in this video. When you do a search for trail race with words and phrases like hardest, toughest, most difficult, and most challenging, you usually get lists of the big ones like Tour de Jean in Italy, Dragon's Back in Wales, Hard Rock 100, the Yukon Arctic Ultra, the Grand Raid de la Réunion, the Transalpine Run, which crosses the Alps from Germany to Italy, the Everest Marathon, the Jungle Marathon in Brazil, the Barkley Marathons, Western States, Badwater, and Marathon des Sables. But many of these races couldn't be more different. A handful of these, like Marathon des Sables and Dragon's Back, are stage races, which are very different than continuous runs of 200 miles or more. In fact, a common theme with races that claim to be so hard seems to be just that they're very long. But by that measure alone, it would be silly to include races like Hard Rock and Western States alongside something like Tour de Jean. But that feels like a bit of a cop-out to me, because obviously running for longer is going to be harder for some at least, and where do you draw the line? But then again, I've always felt that properly training for and executing a really fast 10K could be much more impressive than, say, just barely finishing an ultra under cutoffs. Running fast is hard, just in a different way. Environmental factors definitely play a role in many of the races that seem so difficult. Some are in really hot environments like Badwater in Death Valley, known for being both the driest place in North America and the hottest place in the world. But others are in really cold environments, like the Yukon Arctic Ultra, where runners literally risk losing limbs to frostbite. But a race doesn't have to be even that hot to affect performance for a runner not properly acclimated to the environment. I recently ran a seven-day staged race in the Namib Desert, and I found I was able to adapt to the dry conditions pretty quickly, no doubt thanks to my having arrived in the country a week early to acclimate. The Quebec Mega Trail this past summer in the boreal forests of Quebec I found way more difficult because there we also had really high humidity which I definitely wasn't used to coming from Vancouver. Some of the runners I'd met there though who'd been training locally for the few weeks prior in Quebec seemed to find the humidity to be way less of a problem. But the cold can also be quite relative. I ran the Fat Dog 120 miler years ago during what will forever be remembered as the year of the big storm. The race started out quite warm, but the weather quickly deteriorated into thunder showers and hail. Many runners had to drop because of hypothermia, but I found the cooler conditions to be perfect after throwing on my extra layers. I tend to burn pretty hot while I'm moving, although I do get cold quickly once I'm stopped, but you can always put on more layers if it gets cold, provided you've properly prepared, which admittedly some weren't in that race. And then there's the terrain itself. There's a huge difference in the level of mental effort and focus required between trails that are buffed out and super runnable compared to very technical trails, especially when running at night. But whether we're just talking about roots and rocks underfoot, or having to maybe scramble through boulder fields, or even doing a bit of a bushwhack, some runners are definitely more experienced and confident in technical terrain than others. Of course, it pretty much goes without saying that elevation change is a huge variable. Running a flat and fast course is a totally different experience than one requiring you to climb and descend mountains. But does that automatically make a flat 100 miler easier than a hilly one? I know a lot of runners who would definitely prefer a chance to hike the hills rather than having to try to run the entire time on a flat course, because nobody wants to end up having to walk on flat terrain, yet many end up doing just that. 
All of that running taxes your body in a very different, and for some a much more difficult way than climbing and descending does. And what about altitude? Running a completely flat course above 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet or so may be more difficult for many of us than a hillier course down at sea level. And this is just one of the variables that makes a race like the Hard Rock 100 so difficult. It takes place at an average of around 11,000 feet while reaching 14,000 feet a handful of times. But that's not all that needs to be considered. Most races in North America allow pacers to join a runner, usually from around about the halfway point. And this is partly for safety reasons, since trail races tend to be located in pretty remote terrain with all of the risks that come with that, and the fields of runners are much smaller, so you can end up spending a lot of time alone. But in Europe, where the infrastructure and trail systems are much more developed, and where field sizes tend to be much larger, it's more common for races to not allow pacers. This was the case at both the Tour de Jean in the Italian Alps and the Swiss Peaks 360K that I ran. This can definitely be more of a challenge mentally, especially for newer runners, although less so for others. Audrey, for example, has never had a pacer for a race, and she seems to have no problem at all running alone throughout one or even two nights at a time. The level of support in terms of aid stations can vary as well. Tour de Jean had aid stations pretty much every 10 kilometers or so, so even though I didn't have crew, I felt like I had all of the support that I needed. They even had emergency bivouacs at the top of most of the climbs, which they had helicoptered up, where you could rest and get a cup of soup in a pinch. The Swiss Peaks 360K, by comparison, was a completely different experience. It was a little longer in distance, but with a bit less elevation change. But aid stations there were more like 20 kilometers apart instead of 10, and there were none of those emergency bivouacs on the peaks. And this meant that I'd often find myself alone for hours at a time in the cold of night, which was mentally much more difficult, and having Audrey crewing me there was essential. Some races, though, are just difficult mentally in other ways. I find courses that are either point-to-points or one big loop to be the most inspiring for me. It gives me the feeling like I'm really traveling somewhere, and of course you end up seeing so much more along the way. Compare this to a course like the Hurt 100 in Hawaii, which is basically a series of out and backs where runners really only see something like 18 miles of unique trail. I can only imagine how tempting it would be to drop at the 80 mile mark when you've arrived back at your car for the fourth time. Running at night can be more difficult as well. The Quebec Mega Trail 100 miler that we ran this summer started at 10 p.m. and the sun really didn't come up until about 6 a.m. under the canopy. Audrey won the women's race there, finishing around four in the morning after two nights, meaning she spent more than half the race running in darkness. Having started in the morning instead of at night would have meant the opposite. The time of year of a race can really change this calculation as well. My first 100 miler was one called Chimera in California, which was the last weekend of November. And even though we started running there at 5 a.m., it was dark by about 5 p.m. So again, we ended up spending more time running in darkness than in light. Some races change direction each year. The world famous Comrades Marathon is a good example of this. It's a roughly 90 kilometer run in South Africa, which alternates between a mostly uphill and downhill course each year. Now, it would seem obvious that running downhill should be easier, right? But those who have run both directions would disagree. All of that pounding over 90 kilometers of downhill really does a number on your body, and it requires a completely different approach to your training. And if all of these factors weren't enough, some races aren't even flagged or are flagged more sparsely than others, requiring navigation on top of everything else. Putting aside obvious examples like the Barkley Marathon, there are races like Plain 100, which is a completely self-supported event and which only allows for a single resupply point after the 100k mark. It allows no pacers, there are no aid stations, and no course markings. All of that with 6,400 meters or 21,000 feet of elevation gain plus loss. This race truly is in a class of its own. Speaking of self-supported runs, many stage races require that you carry your own gear and nutrition. The Namib Desert Race that I just completed in October was like this. We had to carry all of our own food, camping equipment, spare clothing, and emergency supplies for the entire week on our backs while running between about 40 to 68 kilometers per day. The only thing we were given was a tent to sleep in at night, hot water to cook our food, and cold water while on course. But we carried everything else from start to finish, from our sleeping bags to nutrition. This is basically like a fast packing competition on a marked course something which was right up my alley. 
I barely had to even buy any new gear, yet alone did I have to figure out much around things like nutrition. But for many runners, this kind of race means entering an entirely new world of logistics and planning with a ton of new variables. So I hope I've laid the foundation for my core argument that it's practically impossible to compare races directly to one another or to claim that one is tougher based on any of these one factors alone. Is heat more difficult than cold? Is it harder to run fast for a shorter distance than to run slow for a much longer distance? And how about carrying gear? Is that what makes a race hard? And at what point does navigation during a trail race make it into more of an orienteering event? But perhaps we can control for many of these factors by looking at a few other things, namely a race's finishing rate, its average finishing time, and its cutoff time. So let's try with a few examples. The Hard Rock 100 is a notoriously hard race which takes place in the San Juan Mountains in Colorado. It combines many of the factors I mentioned before, altitude, some technical terrain, creek crossings, a lot of elevation change, and often really bad weather. In fact, it's common to have mid-afternoon lightning storms develop that time of year after the moisture on the ground evaporates in the warming temperatures throughout the day. It's so common, in fact, that this is one of the reasons the Hard Rock 100 has a relatively long cutoff time of 48 hours. The idea is that runners should have plenty of extra time to head for lower ground and to shelter from a lightning storm if need be, instead of feeling pressured to press on over a potentially very dangerous climb. And that 48 hours is much longer than the cutoff time for most 100 mile races. But consider that the average finishing time of Hard Rock is about 40 and a half hours, which itself is still longer than the cutoff times for most 100 milers. Now of the 140 runners selected to tow the line each year, somewhere around 115 to 125 tend to make it to the finish line under that cutoff time, a finishing rate of about 80 to 90%, which is actually relatively high. But you do need to consider the selection bias built in here, since many of these runners had to run a qualifying race just to get into the lottery, and typically at least a few years in a row before they were finally chosen. So you know they've run at least one difficult 100 miler before, but likely many more than that. In fact, many of these finishers have actually finished Hard Rock before, since the lottery process also favors what are called veterans of the race. So again, there's this additional bias inherent in these numbers. One thing is for sure though, Hard Rock favors those who have spent time training at altitude in the mountains. Being a native to Colorado, or at least living near similar mountain terrain, definitely works to your advantage. Now compare this to a very different race, although one that is challenging in its own way, the Western States Endurance Run. This 100 miler takes place in California, and while it's definitely a trail race, I'm not sure I'd consider it in the same category as mountain races like Hard Rock. Here, there's little risk of storms, of getting lost, or of hypothermia, and runners don't have to deal with issues like altitude sickness. There's also much less elevation change, with 18,000 feet of gain plus 23,000 feet of loss, compared to Hard Rock's 33,000 feet of elevation gain plus equal descent. Western States is also a really well-supported race, and it's not uncommon to see runners carrying nothing but a handheld bottle or two. But it is a notoriously hot race. The cutoff time for Western States is only 30 hours. That's 18 hours less than the Hard Rock 100, with as many as 36% of racers finishing in under 24 hours in cooler years. The average finishing rate here tends to be between around 66 to 81%. This is based on a slightly larger field than Hard Rock of 250 runners, but with a similarly difficult lottery process, so there is a bias here towards only the most experienced runners being included in these stats. But I think it's safe to say that how you've trained your body to handle the heat is going to be a major determining factor in your success at this race. So which race is harder, Hard Rock or Western States? Well, I guess we first need to define what we mean by hard. Do we mean hard for the average runner to finish in under cutoffs? Statistically, it would be tempting to say that Hard Rock is easier to finish, on paper at least, based solely on average finishing rates. It may be the aggressive cutoff time of Western States, in combination with the heat there, that creates for its much lower average finishing rates. But anyone who has stepped foot on the course of the Hard Rock 100 will tell you that there's nothing easy about it. Just because you have two days to finish doesn't mean runners at the back of the pack are having an easier time. Quite the opposite. They're dealing with that much more fatigue and a massive caloric deficit. One thing that is for sure though, Western States would be a lot less difficult if it had a similar 48 hour cutoff time as Hard Rock, with all else being the same. Inversely, shortening Hard Rock's cutoff time by even just a few hours 
would make the race exponentially more difficult. So you could say that what makes Western states so hard is the relatively aggressive cutoff time and really just the expectation that runners tend to set for themselves around pacing that particular course despite the heat. Whereas hard rock is hard just to finish. In fact, really any race could be the most difficult in the world if the cutoff times were set aggressively enough. Just look at a race like the Barkley Marathons for an example of this. It's set in very difficult terrain and with no course markings, but ultimately it's this aggressive cutoff time that leads to sleep deprivation and the virtually non-existent margin of error when it comes to navigation. Even comparing average finishing rates between races can be problematic. We'd have to control for races that have no qualification requirements or standards at all versus those with highly competitive qualification and lottery processes which tends to create that self-selection bias in terms of the types of people who register in the first place. I think it's safe to say that smaller regional races are likely to have lower finishing rates because of this, but don't let this fool you into thinking they're more difficult than the larger and more competitive races with higher finishing rates. That might seem obvious, but I think it's worth considering that most of us cut our teeth and make all of our mistakes on these smaller local races before signing up for the big shows. And that's really the point I'm trying to make here. In choosing your own races, you should consider your own strengths and weaknesses alongside each of the factors that I mentioned previously. Do you like to run fast on the flats or are you stronger when it comes to power hiking? How about running on technical terrain? Consider how much time you'll actually have to dedicate to your training as well as the type of terrain that you'll have access to. It's not to say that you can't train for a race like Hard Rock or Tour de Jean on a treadmill, but you'll get much better results if you can spend at least a couple of weekends in the mountains. Consider the time of year and the environment as well, both where you live and where the race is taking place. Again, you could try to prepare for the heat at a race like Western States by doing heat training in a sauna, but only running outside in the cold probably is not gonna set you up for success. And think about all of those other little things that can make such a big difference, especially when tackling newer distances. Everything from how much time you'll be running at night to how far apart the aid stations are and whether you'll be allowed to have a pacer. But above all, manage your expectations. Just because you live somewhere low and flat doesn't mean you can't race somewhere high and hilly, but just don't expect to perform the same as if you were a local. It's important to get out of our comfort zone and to challenge ourselves to new things, but doing so could turn what would be a relatively easy race for some into the hardest race in the world for you and that might be just the kind of challenge you're looking for. If you found this video helpful, give it a like and be sure to subscribe for more videos like this.